Okay, this is a, an attempt to make a little instructional video on this interesting piece of new music, new chamber music by our friend Hippocrates Chen. It's on a text of Carl Sandburg, a very lovely succinct poem. Lost, which is may how the singer may feel upon viewing this score for baritone and viola, and that's why we're making the video today. So, um, what? And this is his official performance score. And what we see right away is a bunch of black bars and complex rhythms. And the very, very important thing for a singer to realize is that this is not your part. <laughs> so it might get complex later on, but don't be kind of put into a default. I'm scared mode mindset just by the fact of looking at a full score. Um, we see down here then the entrance of the baritone, bar baritone, and then underneath it now we've got two scores um, indicating the viola part with this alto clef right here. And the very first thing you want to do if you're looking at a piece of chamber music, especially if it's newly composed, is find out whether you can get a hold of a C score, C as in the letter C, as in all of the clefs have been transposed uh, to, to C, so that you would be looking at not the alto clef, but a clef that you're more familiar with. This is really important so that, so that I mean, the composer should take note of this as well. The singer is most likely not going to be familiar with reading the alto clef, which locates where C4 is on this middle line here, and much, um, much more improved odds of success are going to be when they're reading off of a treble or a bass clef, ideally their own clef, but of course the viola is a bit of a higher instrument, so there's going to be some moments where, like this right here, where you'll see Hippo decide to put that transposed score in, into both bass clef and treble clef. So as we look then over to what Hippo has sent us here in the Google Drive, we have um, PDFs of the performance score and the study score. And then we have um, recordings of the viola, the voice, both together is what he's given us there. Um, so these are of, of some help, but I would suggest to you that taking a good look at your score, sitting down at the piano, making sure that you can relate the written part of the instrument to what's notated for your voice part is going to be your is going to be your rock. Uh, we really want to own the score and the um, live performance as opposed to basing your learning on imitating a recording of the piece because you're not going to have that in rehearsal. You're going to have the score and the sound of the players in space. So it's, I think it's very important to get as comfortable as you can and make the score as helpful to you as possibly can. So with there again is the performance score and then what Hippo has termed the study score where we can see now that the viola is notated in the bass clef, just as the baritone is. And what do you know? We're just on the same pitch material for the beginning here. And we're going to be seeing, this is notated in the treble clef, we're going to be seeing right here that the thing that happens right before the voice enters is that exactly your pitch, at least at an octave remove, is, is the only thing that you're going to hear before you come in. So instead of all of this, I'm scared of this piece, we have a situation where the composer has made the very evocative choice of having the viola timbre isolate on a certain pitch and the baritone timbre then transition, pick up that same, that same pitch. We may think of it as, thank you for giving me my pitch, but it's really a very beautiful um, artistic effect to go from this, as you can see the text here, desolate and lone, to go from this desolate and lone sounding E4 in the viola to a desolate and lone sounding solo E. Mm, so 
oh, artistically, then we get the kind of a question of, is the, is the poet as lone as they think they are? Because there's this little tiny split of, of the identity of the voice and the identity of the viola. And then that split becomes more and more pronounced as we go on. So all of that is to say, is to underline the importance, number one, of using the score and getting ready to annotate, mark up your score um, as your primary bit of data that you're leaning on in rehearsal, as opposed to trying to ig ignore the notation of the instruments, focusing on your part and singing along with a MIDI recording of your part. That's not going to be there for you in rehearsal. So the next thing that we look at here is the, is the tempo. We see here sad, lonely, and isolated. Thank you, hippo. And corner note equals 50. In contemporary music, very often we see that the composer has chosen to notate around quarter note equals 60. So we have kind of a default um, general tempo area. Because this is so sad and lonely, we're even cranked down from 60 to 50. But we want to be aware that the composer, Kippo does a pretty good job of it, but the composer is probably not going to be prioritizing proportion in a bar. So we see this amount of space equaling one beat, about the same thing equaling two beats, and about half that amount equaling one beat in this one bar right here. And as far as what the viola's proportions are, he's placed this note, which takes up three quarters of the bar at a spot that pretty much looks like it's halfway through. So, dear composers, this is something you can raise your player's ch chances of success by doing a better job of observing proportion. That's not easy, right? You're trying to squeeze a lot of information into fewer pages. I get it. But this is the fact that beat two, three, four takes up not much more space than simply beat one did is, is a cognitive dissonance that your players are going to have to overcome. And whether they know it intellectually is not the same thing as the fact that they're trained to react to what is basically graphic notation in the sense of using proportions for the beat on the page. So the quarter note equals 50. I think I would, as a first, um, first stage, read through, kind of drone through this text with a steady beat. As a matter of fact, you can use a metronome and find your 50 for the pulse. It's almost kind of, you know, slow to hold on to in my head. Let's find out, let's hear a hundred. Desolate and lone. So sometimes going to that um, eighth note pulse is a, is a helpful way to uh, find that inner skeleton a little better. Then the next thing you might do is give yourself a break, since you're new, and crank that metronome down. What if I take 80 for the eighth note? I might get my rhythm a little more accurate than I did the first time. Desolate and lone. Um, so you can, don't spend any time practicing in a tempo that is too hectic for you to get your, um, your feet wet with the piece of music. So that's what I would suggest. You know, take a look at what the tempo marking is. If it's very slow, maybe move yourself into an eighth note subdivision. And if that then feels hectic, you can slow down the eighth note subdivision. And the next thing you're doing then is, as I just demonstrated, droning through in the actual rhythm. If you've got an eighth note pulse going on with a metronome, then something like this dotted quarter note, I would not have any shame in simply counting 
One, two, three, and one, two, three, four, why? Da, 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 da. So, in other words, really important at this stage of learning is that you get the curve, the uh, shape, and the ratio of one syllable to the next correct and reliable and repeatable as soon as possible. So it's not a, um, a, a guessing game, but that you take your time right at the beginning and make sure that the length of one syllable, desolate, those three rhythmic values are accurate so that you and your brain, one and the same thing, you and your brain can understand the proportions. Um, you hear that even if I, as I'm droning, I'm really not paying too much attention to a pitch at this point, but I might go, uh, since uh, Hippo's very fond of these kind of um, swelling, pulsing uh, oscillations, um, up a half or a whole step, that I would go ahead and know that I'm pulsing oh, which brings you to a, another observation here, which is what is the composer after in writing this? We can see that he's written a little um, straight line, a little glissando marked between the beat. So he's looking for a pitch bending effect. Um, so much of our vocal training is about how to be very clean and specific from our choral work. And I've learned this note and that note and this note and that note. Well, then that's really not what composers are after very often. They're after from the vocalist a, an expressive gesture. Um, so we have a little bit of higher airspeed on the F natural note where the, the act of kind of keening that, that uh, lonely moaning sound with one's voice is exactly what the composer is after here. So rather than thinking of ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, within the rhythm, I'm kind of getting used to simply how many pulses. I have a pulse on low and then two more, oh, oh and then two little ones, oh. So that's, that's the um, effect. And there's uh, a lot of positive value in right from the beginning stages of learning a piece to understand why it's written the way it is. Um, it's, it's based on something idiomatic that the human voice does. Even if it seems like an awkward line to you, maybe it's a maybe it's a beginning composer with not quite as much experience as Hippo, Hippo has writing for the voice. Um, nonetheless, it's going to be something that one human vocal mechanism is going to execute. So just don't even engage in a battle of how to do something in a non-idiomatic way, rather move right on towards what is the what is the way that a voice would execute this figure. The next thing we see here is, uh, and Hippo does this quite a bit, he puts in very little tiny specific rests. Here's another instance right down here. That once again, the proportion is problematic then. We have this first beat of the bar taking up as much space as the next two beats all together. Um, so that's, it's a little, it's a little problematic to look at. I would, I would have suggested to Hippo that had dotted 16th, actually, yeah, a dotted 16th rest would be a little um, more uh, accurate for what the singer is going to um, sense. We're just going to sense the downbeat and then get on to the and of one. One, the we, one, the we, as opposed to two pieces of information, which I need to look at two things, and I need to process two pieces of information, when that's not really what Hippo is, is going for here. It's a pretty short amount of time. 
Okay, so popping back here, he's given us this little 16th rest here. We want to, a, a very brief rest is usually full of diction. In this case, we have L's and an N. Um, Hippo has some good experience singing himself, but I think that uh, rest here is a little um, over notated. It's, it's giving you a chance to go all night long, all night long, where there's a, a little period of time where the L and the N is not super loud, but I really don't think that we want to go all night long. The N needs some time, and that's a very short note value. So I would be encouraging our baritone, fine baritone, Stephen um, Mornock, to, to not really stop his breath or look for silence, but simply take this opportunity, this acknowledging on Hippo's part that L and N take their own time all night long. Um, he also has this interesting little extra notation here of the staccato on on the lake. And I think it's the same thing. I think he's giving you a little moment for what I would call an off resonant L. On the lake, on the lake. But we're really not wanting to the lake because you're going to be late with your vowel in that case. Um, so there, there are... These are examples of interpreting what the composer has put on the page based on how you know your instrument to function in its most idiomatic way. Same thing as these kind of pulse, pulsing half-step pulses. Think of it as not an instrumental effect that you're trying to imitate, but rather choices that should go with the nature of language and resonance and your vocal mechanism. Um, we, we see, for instance, he's, he's got this careful dynamic marking here, piano to mezzo piano to pianissimo, piano to mezzo piano to piano again. Basically what we're looking for is a, a hushed, a hushed sound. But I think that if you understand that, that you're definitely going to automatically bring a little amplitude, a little volume to the upper neighbor here on the lake as well here. So something you really want to make sure that you're doing is not being um, intimidated by low dynamic markings and lots of diminuendos. Um, new music and something transparent like this where the texture is, is thin and intimate allows you to experiment with a really transparent timbre. Nevertheless, this is for sustained acoustic vocal production. Do not confuse these markings with something that um, is going to stop your resonance or have you struggling to phonate. Uh, where fog trails. So this is interesting. I, I think that I spoke with Hippo about his text sitting in this piece some time ago. I think he's he's made some choices here that are, uh, you know, they're they're worth noting. Where fog trails, he gives you on a weak beat of the bar his accent up there, which lets you know that he wants you to lean into that accented syllable. It would kind of make me wonder if there's not a different meter being implied here. Nonetheless, we've got, we've got this acknowledgement that we're not after an accented fog, but that all of this functions as a pickup gesture where fog trails and mist cree. So being, being aware of what I call on and off resonance within um, a poetic phrase as well. Um, we've got a little issue here, for instance, with the final K, which needs to be specific and understood in this vanishing gesture that he's written. Lake, lake. 
looking at the texture, I think I would be trying to bring the letter K before this strong beat two. You don't want to, you're going to be best understood if you don't line up with the strong beat of your piano or your other instruments. So we're bringing it a little bit early and we've got this diminuendo gesture. So I'd be aware of allowing the vowel to vanish and yet bringing a K that has airspeed um, and precision to its placement. Leaving it out altogether would be something that I think a composer might, if that's what they desire, they would need to write an introductory note to that effect, or even do something which perhaps you've seen, put the final consonant into parentheses, which lets me know it's not so important that maybe we're after um, uh, an obscuring of the diction. Um, in this case, however, he's not made any of those choices, and I think that that leaves us with the default of definitely making a k, k that is atmospheric and evocative, but nonetheless has what a k requires to be heard. Um, so I, w I would, uh, in this bar, for instance, and really perhaps throughout the piece, because of the, these issues with proportion being a little screwy in the bars, I would take my pencil and draw some slash marks on the big beats in a bar up in the space above it, or possibly also above the viola part, so that I have a graphic kind of handhold, <laughs> something for my brain to hold on to, to show me where the big beats are coming in that bar. Otherwise, the maybe um, rookie new music singer or player would come into this and they are being kind of told to lose track <laughs> because the proportion is off. They're, they are not being rewarded for paying attention. Therefore, they kind of lose themselves in an expressive moment. But when you lose proportion, you lose um, very important scaffolding for breath management and timbre choice. Uh, also, uh, Hippo has written this piece in very careful regular meter, so it's important to him, and therefore there may not be any periods where we lose the rhythmic subdivision and proportion. So to that end, drawing some slashes where those big beats occurs would be a really helpful thing. And again, I would emphasize, do this immediately with your score. Do not practice it for a week and then think, okay, maybe I better do that. Go ahead and mark it up right away so that you don't spend any time with ambiguity. On that uh, front as well, I would always take this word that happens at the beginning of a new line and write it in right here, where a fog, quite specifically, that F is going to happen in this increment of time. If we don't start doing it till here, we're late. And this, the nature of the timbre, how you use your breath and color on this note, is going to slightly vary depending on whether you're jumping up a sixth or down a fifth, or in this case, staying on exactly the same note. So that unvoiced F is going to be filed into exactly the same pitch. Where fog, where fog. So I would be writing the word fog as well as the little dot up here to show me that indeed I'm staying on the same pitch over that line break. This feels really micromanaged, right? But if we do it right away in learning the piece, then I'm practicing not coordination that is um, counterproductive, but rather coordination that helps me remember how the piece goes. It, it's a specifically plotted choreography that I can follow that same path every time, and my learning process is therefore as fleet and efficient as it can be, instead of something that feels stuck. Why did I lose all those things that I worked on yesterday? So fog trails. Stevens worked with me enough to know 
that this confab of consonants here, the G and the T and the R, each one of those things needs its own time. Fog trails, so that your concept of where the main vowel lands is the meter that's notated here. So we have a gutter, fog trails. And here's another good one, mist creeps, where the E registers in this proportion. You have the viola going, we have every bit of subdivision present in this bar. Bump, bum, bump, bum, bum, bum. Do you see those eighths? Dun, 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 E. So again, Hippo has set up a very um, meter observant uh, scheme, schema here. And we want to make sure then that we do it, uh, observe that. He's giving you again this little notation of that dot. And I think that's just rather than you taking the information, he wants this note to be short. I think he's just giving you an indication that you need to take the time for all these unvoiced sounds. Mist Cree. Um, he's giving you this, this little bit of a uh, hint, <laughs> although we can see that the duration of two beats spatially in the bar is, is the same as the duration of one beat over here. So it's kind of helpful, but you know it would be more helpful accurate proportions. So so here I know that um, I have this moving on the and creeps. For this kind of long word, this is another thing that I would do on my first practice session. I would write the PS in right here um, so that my attention to all of these details and the meter doesn't mean I've forgotten what the word is. And keep that, keep that uh, diction notated where you're going to need to use it. He's, this is correct on, on Hippo's part, that it, he has placed it here. But I have forgotten the word in my effort of singing this correctly, and I need to be reminded of it. The fact that I'm coming up on a PS changes or determines the nature of my sustained E vowel here. So let's talk a little bit about, so this is the first instance of uh, something else that this composer is very fond of, and that's this very warmy kind of uh, melismatic writing. So we hear... All right, very warmy, lots of irregular, is it a half step, is it a whole step? Um, I like to use the, the symbols of a... Um, a kind of like this bracket. I think of it as a croquet wicket to help me remember where there's a whole step and just a little hot check up and down to help me remember where there's a half step. So I might go in here and mark a little croquet wicket over A flat, a little hot check over half, and then another hot check. Now we've got a minor third. Half step, major third, croquet wicket, minor third, half step, half step, whole step, croquet wicket, half step. So again, we sound micromanaged, but taking the time to really identify, in order to make those symbols on your music, you have to have really identified what is the pattern of half steps. Um, whole steps, minor thirds, major thirds. Then the next thing that I would do, I, I maybe kind of take the time to write those in, but then I would practice what I call the skeleton of this figure, which might sound something like this. Two beats on creeps one beat on that D flat, and one beat on that F sharp. We understand that that's a you know, second inversion, F sharp minor chord. Then, when I'm really solid with that, I'm going to put in the ands. Here's creeps. It's coming right 
right through there. So this is this is really important because more more important to the composer and the success of the music is that this gesture take up the real estate that it's supposed to take up as opposed to I'm trying to hit these intervals. This is really something akin to the bending emotional use of the voice that he was doing here over only a half step. But because we are in duo with the viola and there is a tonal center in, in um, Hippo's work, we need to really prioritize. <laughs> go through obviously and fill that in one more degree so it's funky 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 in here but important is that this D flat relate to this A just that far and now I'm going to get to bit by bit. Maybe I'll fill in the next part. Here's all of it. So if these little tiny notes amount to nothing more than a bend over the distance that Hippo has indicated, that's really going to be true to what he's after. He gave you that hint here already. Much more important is to get the overall contour and the emotive, expressive nature of how your voice is working. If this ends up being slightly fakey for a while, if you've ended on a true F sharp there, you've done the right thing. The next thing that we notice here, we're in the bass clef for the viola, and we get these, um, it makes me think a little bit of the danse macabre, right? Kind of this open fifth string thing strings or wants to do. We're hearing this. So I'm oscillating between uh, an E. I'm going to take the time to kind of figure that on the piano. So you're hearing this. really locks with those open fifths from the viola. Again, here, practicing the rhythm, which is not really what it looks like. One, the whistle of a, with the kind of surprise that the soul is on a strong beat. Baram, the we, baram, soul of bram, bra, boat. I'm looking at the composite rhythm. So once again, the strategy is not to resolve to ignore the viola and do your part the way you learned it, but incorporate the viola part in your learning of your part so that when you hear it, instead of being annoying and alarming, it finally fills in the blank that you prepared for it. All right, so we've got, the, again, this challenge here of figuring out the skeleton. Uh, here's something that happens a few times with for in Hippo's writing. He's given you two eighth notes. That doesn't mean that he wants you to go bo, bo, but rather your slide down a fifth is going to commence on the end of the beat. So I would start by just learning one, two. Boat, boat. Um, so again, it's an idiomatic organic um, vocal gesture. Okay, we've got a couple of funky um, rhythm divisions here. We had something pretty familiar with these fours, yaga, daga, 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 daga. 
And we've got these unusual odd numbered divisions. Personally, for five, I like to remind myself of unbelievable, which is five syllables. And if it's a seven, I like to think about really unbelievable. So this bees beats here would be unbelievable, really unbelievable, da 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 Here's a triplet, da 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 You can divide it as three twos or two threes. But I would go ahead and, you know, you heard me there going da 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 or da ba da ba da ba da da unbelievable, really unbelievable, da 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 so that you get the feel for how the gazamped figure, how all of that rhythm together makes a gesture up to the top. Um, the, I see down here that the violist is in a seven over that, so you're not really going to be in the position of lining up with the viola in the moment, but you have these beats so that you guys can get on the same page or the same bar, so to speak, one, uh, two. Now already things are pulling apart. So there might be a situation in rehearsal where you ask the violist to kind of use the scroll of their instrument to indicate where the big beats are. They would indicate one, two, a little pulse with the scroll. La da da da, unbelievable, really unbelievable one. Um, so there's understanding the rhythmic gesture and then we're going to go back in and take a look at the pitch skeleton of this. We've established this. It's going to go from here not terribly tuneful but certainly more tuneful than trying to hit all of those notes. So I'm going to take it step by step. Five one I think I might put in this A down there because it gives me a nice 5-1 gesture up to this. And I think I'm going to put in the D to my skeleton here to add that, that stability. So I'm playing for you right now. B, E, C, A, D, G sharp, D, F. I've kind of picked out the notes that are within um, a harmonic progression, a bit of a harmonic series. Makes sense to our ears, also timbre-wise. Three. So if I'm filling this in, I believe that's a flat. these asymmetric rhythms, we're looking to understand them in a way that accelerates to the next beat, as opposed to somehow being faster in the middle or faster at the beginning. I don't really feel that kind of schwung, you say in German, into the next main beat. I'm going back here to, uh, I'm filling in now to the C that is going to happen on the fourth big beat of this 5-4 bar. comfortable with that first, making sure that you really understand. If I were using unbelievable, unbelievable one, unbelievable one. I'm going to use that. So if I have a group of three, is a little surprising to me in a way that whole step so I might go in with that croquet wicket and mark it from C to D as a whole step so you're really preparing your understanding of this on two separate fronts the pulse proportion of the bar and then kind of the um, melodic skeleton 
underneath a figure so that you're oriented I might even imagine our practice kind of resolving to an E natural after that high F as a way to refer to the last stable thing I had. If I imagine it resolving down to an E, it's going to well, anchor me to the beginning of the melodic gesture there. One way or the other, you should always count on screwing up. <laughs> so you're looking for how do I reorient myself or confirm that I'm correct all the time. Um, we have mo uh, material here in the viola, or in the bass clef here, that takes us up to a G and an F. So I would practice, you know, talked about resolving down, or we could practice even before I meet my fine violist, expecting here's the sung F, and then I would play this on the piano, which is what's going to happen right here, G, F, E. Of course, it's very much the case that you won't know that you screwed up until you hear that you screwed up. But if, you, if we can know in advance um, what we're going to correct to, then at least you can figure out, oh, I was a little high on that F or I was a little low on that F because that's what I was relative to what I then heard from the viola. Once again, really important to um, build in your expectation and your anticipation, your eager anticipation of the contribution of the instrument as opposed to um, saying, okay, and now I'm done. <laughs> and then we have this little figure from the viola that's establishing a nice pulse again. And then we hear the baritone entering a half step higher, calls and cries. I would again, as with all of these lines, I would write the word and the pitch that is coming up right here in the space after it. Here, I would write it. I would write my calls on that F line with the word calls and a, an arrow to let me know, get ready. The sound of the K is indeed going to happen within this bar here. Calls and cries. And see, Hippo's used to that notation again of the staccato over this little tiny note. I'm, as you can probably tell, I think Hippo's doing a great job of writing for the voice, um, but I'm going to reinterpret that staccato as not an instrumental staccato, but rather truly a vocal staccato in that it's full of diction. In this case, I would make it be full of that plosive K sound, and I might leave out the D altogether calls and cries, calls and cries. Um, it's going to, in that moaning motif that we have, um, the important words here are the calling and the crying. So I want to not feel any compunction to hammer in the letter D there. It's really not what's important in that moment. Unendingly. Once again, I'm identifying how many of the high notes are there. E ah, wow, wow. Um, like some lost child. He gives us, you can hardly see it here, but it, it's again that moaning up of the, um, the half step motion there. Uh, here's a big unbelievable, if you'd like to try that. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Four, I'm writing in what my next pitch is here, and I will go ahead and learn this with an implied D3 underneath it. So, like some lost child. So I've, I've anchored my A natural to a quasi-resolving D, and indeed that is what comes up next with some more of those string open fifths. Mm -hmm. 
So that should, we should be able to be really reliable with our pitch there, the C sharp to the D. Um, I would make a point of writing that this is a C natural because it is in the treble clef at this point and it might fool us into thinking it's a low E. So we've got a C sounding and a um, displaced octave of So a, a hippo does this quite a bit where there's dissonance between the instrument and the voice which then resolves. Alright, here's another flurry of notes. Can you imagine what the skeleton for this might be? So rather than the D, I'm going to choose the thing that happens on the strong beat. The. You've got enough muscle memory to, if I sing that figure, then I'll know where I need to get with the notes in between. So now I'm filling in. Um, he's got this typo here a couple of times, harbors, breast, which... Uh, Interestingly, it's not either bore or bar, but b b with a kind of nice schwa color. Um, there's a interesting assonance between the second syllable of har burs and this consonant cluster here of bur. Har burs bur burs burst burs burst. Um, again, I would write that in here because the br is going to happen in this time, and the e. Eh is going to land on that C sharp. Um, I would uh, strongly recommend separating the E eh from the act of st. So that would come right on the eighth note rest. St. This notation um, bears a little comment. You can see how he's got kind of a crescendo in the bar under these 16th notes here. That means that this first note has a longer duration and they get subsequently shorter until we arrive at the fourth big beat of the bar. I, I would suggest that this is almost an entire eighth note. Bre ha 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 ha, ha ha um, there's space here for that good, strong, separated ST again. I would, once again, not bother with the D and the HA and the HABA's eyes um, for this passage here. Um, good diction does not mean the printed letters are all audible. It means the fluency of the poetry is flawlessly understood by the listener. So this very quick rhythm and the ha and the ha bruise shows us that the composer is after a very oh, kind of off resonant pickup and the ha bruise eyes. Um, and frankly, the poet has indicated that as well. He's not interested in and the harbors. He's trying to show us hunting the harbor's breast and the harbor's eyes. Now that's the least important, and we want to make sure that we don't clutter it up by drawing attention to the not important part of the poetry. This is a, a interesting thing to observe too, that we've got these really big string crossings in the viola. More important than being able to read all these notes is to identify with the sound of the top, which is this G sharp four, and the sound of the bottom, which is this C three. So I would kind of expect to, you know, maybe practice on the piano. Um, here's one, one. So that I'm understanding Rye 
arriving at the resolution of all those G sharps. These G sharps. To these nice unison A naturals. That gets picked up. So again, I, here's a florid passage, right? I'm going to absolutely weed those out and make sure that I learn a really big skeleton. Here's um, beat three. Four, one, two, one, two. Not super tuneful, but better to learn those than to learn the, that big mess without any anchor points. So we're, we're very much on board that beat four of bar 39 is going to be just reiterating exactly the same tone color of eyes before it. You hear the acceleration there? I chose to do a grouping of three. I would take my pencil and mark this as a whole step. This is a half step, and that bar sounds like. Uh, sorry. Now we have just an oscillation, really unbelievable. Notice that I'm still grouping it in a kind of accelerating gesture. One, two, three, one. And then I have a more difficult figure for this beat. I definitely practice just the a regular oscillation. So I'm thinking of this high F as a displaced resolution of that low F sharp. Can I fill in now? Oh, that's a pretty uh, recognizable F major arpeggio in the middle. So maybe there's a good bit of skeleton to go for. Here's beat one. Understand that whole second beat as half step appoggiaturas away from an F major arpeggio. Knowing that I'm expecting to hear that anchoring D on the downbeat. Notice that the viola is here in treble clef. So whenever I come to a big arrival point, I really must, must, must um, look at what to expect from my partner there. Uh, you might think that this is an E sharp matching your F, but it's not. It's a D and a C sharp. I'm going to kind of just get acquainted with that sonority so it doesn't freak me out when I have to plug it in with the violist. Okay, more skeletons. I think I might go for the F. It's quite diatonic once we hit the D. And then fill in to some more kind of eighth notes to build. Yeah, so for sure I'm writing this C sharp right up here so that I can really make my big plan. Anchor 
her to that C. And we've got these gestures. Okay, good news that even though that looks like two different figures, it's the same thing twice. I'm really going to ring that low C. to nail here is going to be the change between the B natural to the B flat. All right. So that's not a that's not an easy thing, but I hope it now looks like it's not as hard as it seemed at first. You want to get down the seventh. even practice this skeleton of B to B flat C D flat so the real payoff the end of the gesture definitely whatever happens before it definitely um, is the consequence of what came before all right and we notice here that the uh, the viola has been reiterating D's. And the baritone is entering here a half step below this. So I, I would mark my little hot checks showing me that this G flat descends a half step to an F, descends a half step to the baritone's note. Oh, I'm completely lying, aren't I? So that's treble clef, and then up a whole step. All right, so there we have a real point of consonance between the arrival at the D and the fifth of that sonority down there for the baritone. interval this major seventh you know, to always uh, for your work with Webern or Schoenberg anybody working with kind of exploded octaves is to learn it in its most um, adjacent incarnation so I would learn that's D C sharp C D E flat so that even as I'm singing this actual leap, I'm hearing um, that could go on here with this um, departure from the bar as well. You're pulsing to that E flat. the fog in right here and that it's on the same note and relate to the E flat above it. More skeleton going on. Here again we've got that little tiny rest which you can definitely catch a breath in if you need one but uh, I kind of feel like it's so brief that I would just use it for diction. Where fog trails. And there's a little more time for a breath at that point. So rather than breathing because you see a rest, consider filling it with diction. Fog trails and mist. So here's a separate effect. Notice that Hippo did not use that acceleration mark here in the bars. So we're going to make it quite square. Two. So uh, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit, identifying where the beats are. I'd put a big strong hash at two. One, two, and. Ah. 
one and two and. And we've gone over this a couple of times now as far as finding the skeleton. So two beats of creeps, one, two. I'm trying to see if that's a sharper, a natural. Let's say it's a sharp. Yeah, it's a sharp because there's a natural before it. I might put that pickup in there to bridge the gap from. So here's that skeleton for that bar 48. Two, three. Maybe put in the pickup for that low note next. for those tricky half steps as just an appoggiatura to the main note and then we're working in the little bits of the remaining gesture the whistle of a boat um, yeah so my students are very familiar with me talking about high airspeed for a consonant, especially an unvoiced consonant, and low airspeed for a vowel and especially a low vowel. So keep that in mind, and I would not try to connect the T to this note. Boat. Boat. Um, I think for sure the, the kind of tone here is not as important as the effect of the whistle of a boat. Oh, I would really lower my larynx and hoot that. And speaking of effects, the whistle of a boat, the whistle of a boat. Generally, an X'd head means unvoiced. So I would expect it to be something like what I just demonstrated. The whistle of a boat. You can hear uh, definite use of under vowel colors in order to understand the difference between the i vowel of and the o vowel of um, a little a little uh, contact a little little louis armstrong contact of a is is not out of the question there in terms of making sure that you're audible all right now we have calls and cries again i would suggest no letter d in there Calls and cries, unendingly unbelievable, like some lost child. We had this before where he puts the emphasized beat. It's kind of a, a written out scoop, right? It happens before beat two and scoops up to this. Un, really unba, really unba, really unbelievable. Um, and then we have this interesting effect here where he has you indicated that you move into falsetto. You're on an E vowel. And he has very correctly identified that above the D4, registration is going to happen. Um, so we're really going for an, not even a ten, tenor kind of adduction there but something that is definitely way divergent back. It's a bit of a skipping over a register. And then we have this event. It's still in the falsetto that you've located. I would say that just taking a guess that the sound of the R and is going to be helpful for staying in your falsetto sound there. Trouble. There are a couple of places in this text where an implied L is happening. This would be a place that I would um, recommend that. <coughs> Rather than making sure that people can hear the spelling of the word, we want them to only hear the natural way that they're used to hearing the word. So trouble is not really what we're used to hearing. Trouble, 
trouble. Doesn't really have an audible point of contact for that L. We'll go back and, and see if there are other, well, here's one right now, calls, calls. I don't think that I would really put a tip of the tongue L in there, calls, but calls. It's almost like a crow's cause and cries, calls. Just a little bit of fancy vowel spectrum to imply an L without making a point of pronouncing um, a non-indigenous L there. Don't be a colonizer. Um, going on, haunting. This is kind of interesting. He's marked this with an accent. Absolutely, I would think about bringing that audible H in this bar. Uh, haunting the life. So this is gonna, uh, this little flourish is going to be reminiscent of this harmonic series that you visited up here. Now we have a much more harmonious, it sounds like a wind chime collection of notes rather than the the snug chromaticism of other figures. Um, bringing the H early. Haunting the harbor's breast, breast. There's one of those accelerating figures. And we notice this time that it's in rhythmic unison with the viola. This whole bar is, right? So we really want to be very strong with that. Harbor's breast, breast, breast. Um, for sure, the singer's use of these consonants, stpr, stpr, is going to function like a conductor's gesture to show the uh, violist where we want beat three to come. Stpr-breast. I would not hesitate to feel H's through these. Breast. And the, again, no D, too quick, not necessary. And the bars, and the harbors, harbors, eyes. To me, that sounds like a Doppler effect, doesn't it? If you think about a Doppler effect, it's something becoming more distant. Let's talk about these interesting marks here down for the viola. Um, something singers don't get to do is this big bow crossing, string crossing again. You notice that it's going to be that jaggy line means it's going to be kind of loosely arpeggiated. And this one's going to be in an upward flowing direction. This one flows to the bass note. This one flows to the treble note. Treble, 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 treble. So in general, in thinking about what am I going to hear in the instrumental parts around me, the lowest note and the highest note are the things that are going to be easiest to pick out of a thick texture. Um, in this case, the gesture is leading to the top note, and here it's leading to the bottom note, which in this case is a low C. So I might play on the piano for myself as preparation. This for bar 62. So that I'm expecting E, C, E. If you want to fill in the gaps there, it's, I'm oh, sorry. So that doesn't take you by surprise and you should be able to confirm your C natural with beat two from the viola. Do you see a skeleton coming up? You're right. Let's take a look. Here's beat three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and, sorry, yeah, one, and, Sounds very disjunct, but I promise you that's going to be more useful to learn than the many, many other notes. It gives you those corners to define the field. Harbor's eyes, beat three, four, one, two, three, four, one,
Now filling that in, we've got that little bit of oscillation under I, so R goes ah. Useful to know that we're returning to the C. And then we're on a half step lower. Notice that I'm still kind of going with that group of three plus group of four. Kind of useful, they're revisiting that F arpeggio. Oh, that makes me wonder if that previous figure that was like this is a typo. Do you remember? We looked at that run down. It was right here. So I'm going to ask Hippo about that because here's that same figure, but and here at the end it is written as you know both of them are beautiful, but doesn't hurt. It might be that little moment where the composer says, "Wow, this is a really attentive singer." Here's beat three of the previous bar three four. It's a really beautiful collection of pitches, but we have to know how to physically dance our way through there. So knowing where those heavy beats fall relative to each other and where the whole steps and the half steps exist, very important. Chromatic for where we're starting out there in the last beat of 64. And then we've got this almost diatonic motion. Now we've got this kind of gesture now. Is it natural? So I would take it beat at a time. Second, that second half resolves the first, kind of, right? Noting that the A natural is the same for both of these, and the low note descends from C to B. I might even start by learning that last beat, because it's beautifully diatonic, right? And then trying the two before it. And finally, we drop down an octave to say desolate. And again, I would highly recommend not interpreting a staccato in the usual sense of separate but rather room to connect solat. I would imagine the upper octave and move away from it. You'll, you'll also hear the upper octave in what happens for the viola. We see it's in the treble clef. The highest note you hear is going to be a D sharp. That's going to be up here. D sharp, D sharp, E, E. Those are these two D-sharps, these two E's, and then you're imitating what you heard from the viola, but instead of resolving up to the E, which is lying here in the viola, we're in a half step distance from it, and you can tell that Hippo really wants to hear that. question of heavy vibrato that came um, up earlier in the piece as well. Uh, I would say, say important here is that you're choosing that kind of tracheal pole feeling. Ah, um, where's it? Uh, low, as opposed to pushing at it, especially because we're diminuendoing down to niente. 
you might bring in the N as early as this downbeat and try to keep the texture of the rapid vibrato. I might almost think rapid rather than heavy. Um, I think that's even backed up by this graphic notation here that instead of showing some kind of slow oscillating graphic, he's given you this, this texture right here. So he's looking for something that kind of has Mm, aerodynamic unrest in it. Oh, all the way through to the end, getting into the end and keeping up that same, that same texture. All right, that's a lot of info. Let's see how long that recording is and find out whether it's going to be helpful or not.